Hello, good afternoon. Let's start. Good afternoon, class. <laughs> Hi. OK, so today is more on functionalism and um, Ned Blocks. <laughs> Ned Blocks troubles with functionalism. And on Thursday, Thursday we look at Martina Nida Rumelan's pseudo-normal vision. Um, again, it's a very short article. It's, it's in the block. It's just a few pages long. Um, OK, uh, just a remark about the essay that's due, when is it, October the 3rd or so? Um, in the essay, uh, it says, the first paragraph of your essay must state the main thesis for which you wish to argue in the essay. And um, this is something I haven't done before in, the, in, in class, but it occurred to me it might be kind of fun or interesting to hear something about I guess some of you, anyway, will have been thinking a little bit about the essay already, although there is plenty of time uh, as yet. Um, but it might be interesting to hear what kind of thesis people are thinking of arguing for. Um, if you don't mind sharing what thesis you're wishing, yeah, I mean, uh, if you've got some diabolically clever, ingenious thesis that you wish to argue for, then that's fine. Yeah, and if you want to keep that secret, that's fine. But. Um, if, if you don't mind sharing with other people what, your th what the main thesis is, I thought we might leave some time at the end, and I might actually call on people randomly and just see uh, what kind of thesis people are thinking of arguing for. Um, it might be interesting, or it would be interesting for me, and it might be interesting for other people too. Um, does anyone have it? Does anyone wish to say anything at this point? Has anyone identified their thesis and doesn't mind sharing it for, for, for the essay? And even provisionally, you're not committing yourself. Boy, that was overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> no one at all? OK, well, you have what, um, you have about 60 minutes. OK, just think of what kind of thesis you might be arguing for in your essay. As I say, it might, it need not be, um, uh, actually, I forget what I was going to say. Um, it need not be the thesis you eventually wind up arguing for. You're not committing yourself. It would just be interesting to hear what your direction of thought is. I mean, for example, behaviorism is true might be one thesis. You see what I mean? It doesn't have to be. Um, it can be an A essay without having anything very startling in the, in the way of the thesis. Yeah? OK. Um, OK, so that's your task uh, for the next 60 minutes. OK, so um, I'll start out by going back over a bit what the motivation for functionalism is, and then look at Bloch's objection, Blockhead, to functionalism. Um, I want to begin with, there's, uh, so there's something I didn't really explain very well l last time in this variable realizability argument for functionalism. And both during the class and talking to people afterwards, a few people said to me uh, something along the lines of, well, this is all very wishy-washy, isn't it? Or um, they put it more courteously than that. But it's something along the lines of, there's a lot of what ifs here. Um, what if there were different, uh, what if there were aliens? What, 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 what if you could have octopuses that felt pain? Um, and uh, isn't that all just um, hypotheses you're making? Um, I, that's not really the point, but this is a little bit subtle. So um, see, if you, see if you can come with me here. This statement, pain could be realized by different physical structures. That's a statement about what's possible. That's a statement about what could happen, right? I say that whole statement is definitely true. You have the right to disagree with it. You will not be penalized if you disagree with me on this. But I think that's definitely true. And I think it's definitely true because when I think about, say, the Star Wars movies or any kind of alien movie, it seems entirely possible that you could have creatures with different physical structures to ours that were nonetheless clearly capable of feeling pain. That, that just, 
that seems so obvious, I'm not sure how to explain it further, if you see what I mean. Um, I'm not saying there are aliens. I'm just saying the idea makes perfect sense. Um, and I think the octopus is a good candidate for a creature that doesn't have our kind of brain structure, but nonetheless is capable of feeling things like pain or hunger. So it may sound as if I'm just saying a whole bunch of what ifs, but what I really am getting at here is that this is definitely true. It really is possible for uh, pain to be realized by creatures with different physical structures, whether or not there are any. Um, it's as if, I was trying to think of an example, it's as if someone said, look, wires, conductors have just got to be made of copper. Whenever you see a wiring diagram, the, the line always means copper. And you say, but there are plenty, you could have wires that weren't made of copper. And they say, well, have you ever seen any of those so-called wires? Um, um, this is all a bit hand wavy, what ify. It's just perfectly possible. You could make, even if nobody has ever made a wire of anything other than copper, you could perfectly well make wires of aluminum or anything else. If someone gave a definition of a nuclear family that said it's a structure of 30 or less individuals with a single mother and father and a bunch of children, then the perfectly natural reaction to that is to say, but you could have a nuclear family with 31 children. Of course that's possible. I mean, <laughs> your heart goes out to them. But of course, <laughs> uh, of course that's perfectly possible. You, you see what I mean? Anyone who defines it, family, in such a way that there couldn't be more than 30 people in it, is just making a mistake. And it's not that I'm doing, this is some kind of airy-fairy nonsense about um, uh, 30 families with 30, who's ever seen such a thing, family with 31 people in them? It's not, that's not what the thing is. What makes it a family doesn't restrict it to having any particular number of members. So it being pain, doesn't restrict it to being any one physical structure. That's really the key thing. Okay, And these points about octopuses or aliens or plasticity of the brain in an individual, so that if a single individual gets a bit of brain damage, other uh, our brain structures will be recruited to fill the function that, uh, that the original, but the damaged brain structure used to do. Um, these points, um, uh, just illustrate something that's perfectly definite and perfectly possible. That's my claim. You have the right to disagree. I'm happy for anyone to disagree. But um, it's not a what if. Yeah, you see what I mean? It's, it's, it's pointing out something that seems so obviously correct that this is possible. Anything? Questions? Comments? Plain as day? OK, so that's the variable realizability argument against physicalism. Because if pain just was the same thing as having C-fiber firing, then you couldn't have um, these possibilities. Yeah? If pain was really just the same thing as C-fiber firing. So another way to get at the same point is um, these remarks like pain is C-fiber firing or the feeling of sorrow is an electrochemical discharge these really seem kind of mind-bending to people, and they seem kind of mind-bending in the, kind of the same way as if uh, I, I said, look, look, here I have a humble piece of chalk. Yep, this piece of chalk, it has been discovered over in um, advanced mathematics. They have discovered that the number eight actually is this piece of chalk. Look at it. Um, <laughs> People have been wondering for centuries about the nature of numbers, and it turns out here it is, the number eight. Um, the number nine is a small rock. Um, and when you look, when you think, well, there's a number nine, there's a small rock, it's the same thing. What, what could be plainer than that? I mean, would it, <laughs> if they come out of their eerie up in the hill at the Maths Institute, and they say, look, we found out what the number eight is, or we found out what the number nine is, then anyone's reaction has been, well, I'm sure the maths is great, but that can't be right, <laughs> R right? That just can't be right. How could that be? Yeah, I mean, anyone's got that, going to have that reaction. 
It just cannot be right. And similarly, if you're told um, the feeling of sorrow is an electrochemical discharge, they, they, you, the natural, anybody's reaction is just a kind of wonder as to how on earth that could possibly be true. Yeah? The sensation of red just is synchronized firing in V4. How, how could that be? You got the, your head sliced off, the top of your head sliced off, you got the mirror, you're looking at the uh, brain, and you're saying, this experience I'm having right now is the same as that chemical activity going on up there. How could that be? Well, one of the, appeal, one of the appeals of functionalism is that it's trying to explain what the connection could be between the feeling of sorrow and electrochemical discharge. Because suppose you describe what the causes and the effects of sorrow are. I mean, I don't say this is some uh, advanced theory here. I mean, this is, I, I just thought about this for about 10 minutes. But if you think about what the causes of sorrow are, you have some, well, I mean, isn't this sensible? Isn't this something like what the causes of sorrow are? You have some tragedy in your life. There is some tragic event. You pay attention to it. If you just completely blank it, you're maybe not going to feel the sorrow so much. But if you've got these two things, attention and the tragic event, then that's going to generate sorrow. And if you're in this state of sorrow, if you're plunged into sorrow by something, then what's going to happen next? You might have a tendency to ruminate over the tragic event that will cause you to feel further emotions, grief, anger, denial, uh, a desire for revenge, <laughs> for, however it works. Um, and those in turn will feed back into the sorrow, and the rumination may feed back into the sorrow. So you get a kind of loop here. Yep? What if you were to look into the mind of like a sociopath, you can't feel any emotion. And right. the only difference you find is that love, there are no electrical chemical discharges. Like, could you say that electrical chemical discharges are what causes sorrow? Um, I, at the moment, I'm not, uh, I'm not thinking of whether the electrochemical discharges are what cause sorrow. I'm thinking of whether they're the same thing as the sorrow. Right? The, 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 that's, a, that's not your whole point, but that's just one part of what you just said. Yeah. Um, so with a sociopath, what you would expect looking in is that you don't find any brain structure that's playing this functional role. If the sociopath is looking at a tragic event, paying attention to it, then there isn't anything that is going to lead them to ruminate, feel further emotions, go back to the, go back to the original, go back to the, the S state. Th that's what's missing in the sociopath, anything that plays that kind of role. You, you see what I mean? Th th that's what I'm saying. Th is that addressing your question? Yeah. We'll come back if, the, if it turns out there's more. Yeah. If everybody had the exact same brain, yeah, they would all be feeling the same. So far, that's what it seems to be saying. Because if everybody had the same functional structure, they'd all have exactly the same mental states. But actually, this is just getting ahead a little bit. Can you come back to that in just a second? At the moment, all I mean to be doing is saying, this is what the functional structure of sorrow is. Yeah, and that seems kind of reasonable. Yeah. No room for randomness. No room for randomness. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, there's plenty of room for randomness. These arrows don't mean um, that the thing necessitates rumination. They just mean something like it generally causes rumination or it increases the probability of rumination. There are things about what causes what. I mean, if you say um, uh, grief leads to anger, the kind of thing Yoda uh, used to say, right? Um, then that's not to say grief always leads to anger or grief deterministically leads to anger. It would not, when Yoda says grief leads to anger, it would not be a refutation of Yoda to say, well, I once felt real grief, but I didn't get angry that time. 
you see what I mean? Yoda's just making a statement about what generally happens, what generally causes what. So um, that state S has a tendency to cause uh, rumination and so on. Grief has a tendency to cause anger. But that's not to say it's exceptionless. But the general question you're raising here about, uh, about freedom, th th that's what you mean to be raising, right? Yeah, are you determined? Does, does everything get out of your control? Uh, we're going to s spend a significant amount of time on that later. We're, we're right at the start here, <laughs> if, you, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Uh, OK. okay. Um, so I said, just by thinking about it, you can tell that's the functional structure of sorrow. Something like that. I mean, you, you could probably, uh, each of you could probably correct that a bit and make that a bit better. But you can tell that something like that's not bad for sorrow. Um, so then if you ask, what makes this identical to a brain state? What's going to make th the brain state relevant is the brain state has that functional role too. You knew just by thinking about it that sorrow's got these causes and effects. And then you find in the brain there's a particular electrochemical discharge that has these causes and effects. And that what makes you say, so sorrow is that electrochemical discharge. That's how it's intelligible. That's how it's, see, with a number nine, you can't do that kind of stuff. You can't say anything about, well, I, <laughs> you probably, well, I don't know. I, I, I can't see how to elaborate it straight off, that you can say what makes something the number nine or what makes something a small rock that would make it intelligible how you identify them. But here with sorrow and the electrochemical discharge, you can do something like that. You can say, you know what the um, functional role of sorrow is. And it's clear what I mean by functional role, the characteristic causes and effects, the inputs and outputs of sorrow. Um, and then um, uh, you find the particular brain states have just those characteristic causes and effects have just those same psychological, just those same functional roles. And at that point, you can say, but what matters for it being sorrow is not which brain state it is. That's the thing about variable realizability. You could have something that had a different brain state, but just the same functional role for it. And then you could say, well, that would be sorrow then too. OK. Is, there, is that all right? That should, if I'm explaining this clearly, that should be, yep. <laughs> How is that functionalism? OK. F uh, functionalism is the view that what makes a state, the psycho a psychological state, the psychological state it is, is its characteristic causes and effects. Yeah. So if it's got these inputs and outputs, uh, these inputs and outputs, then it's sorrow. Yeah. It doesn't matter which particular um, chemical or biological state it is, so long as it's got these inputs and outputs, then it's going to be sorrow. Is that completely plain at this point? I encourage you to say what the hell if, I, I don't mean, <laughs> I don't mean that. <laughs> uh, uh, if, uh, if that's not completely clear, yeah. That's right. Chemicals can cause sorrow without being sorry, yeah. Uh, that is not the functionalist argument. Um, the thing is, uh, you've got a complex structure. You've got a complex bit of wiring in the brain, yeah? And the thing is that sorrow actually identifies a particular point in that wiring. Do, do you see what I mean? It's not that, the, uh, so, um, if you have an electrochemical discharge there, that is what's realizing the sorrow. It's not that it's causing the sorrow. That is taking the role of sorrow on. Um, look, if you take a switch, you know, take a door. Take a simple door, right? Door is a functional classification. Variable realizability applies to doors, right? You can make a door of practically anything. Yep. Um, uh, now, so I take it that this door is made of wood, I guess, right? Okay. Do you have to make a door of wood? No, no right. Can't you make a door of lots of different stuff? 
does the notion of variable realizability apply to doors? Yes, right? So, but now take this block of wood. Does that, is that block of wood what makes it a door? No, but that block of wood has a functional role. It's got two states, open and shut. When it's in the open state, you can get in and out. When it's not in the open state, you can't get in and out, right? Yeah. But does that block of wood cause the existence of a door? No, that's the wrong way to think of it, right? That's what I mean. That's what I don't like about your question, if, if you don't mind me saying so. <laughs> the, the block of wood is not causing the presence of a door. That makes it sound like a door is something kind of shimmering beyond the wood. <laughs> you, feel, I mean, you think, wait a minute, I can only see the wood. <laughs> Where's the door again? If this, if this is just causing the door, that, that couldn't be the right way to think of it, right? So the electrochemical structure in the brain is not causing the sorrow as if the sorrow was something over and above it. It's that electrochemical discharge that is playing the functional role of the sorrow. It's this block of wood that is playing the role of the door. Yeah? It doesn't cause the presence of a door. It's not quite right to say it actually is the door. It's, but there wouldn't be a door without it. <laughs> right. OK, I, ho I hope that hasn't just got you puzzled about doors, too. But anyway. Um, <laughs> right. so, so the only thing you were saying is it's calm. Sorrow can't be electrical discharge, particularly because I mean, for example, for example, uh, we have we have billions of of neurons and billions of uh, connections between neurons. Uh -huh. So, are we able to say we can imagine anything about the brain? Are we able to say we can imagine what such a complex system causes this problem? So you're you're claiming that there has to be more than electrical discharge. Sorrow is not electrical. The reason for saying sorrow is not the same thing as any particular electrochemical discharge is like the reason that you can't define a family as something having less than 30 members, right? That it's evidently possible that there could be families of more than 30 members. It's evidently possible that there could be creatures of other species or whatever that don't have that elect electrochemical state but are capable of feeling sorrow. No, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the thing I began by rejecting, right? I'm not saying you just, you just can't be sure. Look, that's the point here. This statement is definitely true. That's what I'm saying, right? Um, it's possible that pain is realized, that there are different physical structures realizing pain. If pain was just the same thing as C-fiber firing, that statement about what's possible would not be true. But it is definitely true. Pain could be realized by different physical structures. That's what I began by saying. There are different kinds of pain, and if you just think about humans, there's nothing else. That's right. That's like saying conduct, being a conductor is just the same thing as being made of copper. If I just think about copper, then being a conductor is just the same thing as copper. Right? That, that, that would be that kind of argument. Yeah. That's missing the point. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the way they might, they might help is it seems like um, well, you, you know, someone was thinking about uh, how the, what, what exactly the neural chemicals are playing in realizing a role. Yeah. Uh, you kind of mentioned this, this analogy of like quarterbacks, like particular quarterbacks and the role of quarterbacks. Quarter, very good, yes, so, yes. So like, well, right. Tom Brady uh, is a quarterback. Right. Um, but quarter, what, the idea of what a quarterback is is not Tom Brady. Exactly, right. So, so you, you have, yeah. Right. Chemical discharge can be the sorrow. But that's not to say sorrow is just is that is the thing that causes. That's a great example. Being a, not yeah. Just, not just Quarterback is a functionally defined notion. If anything is right, quarterback has to do with the role that this thing plays in the whole system. And if someone says, "Well, but you're just saying there could be quarterbacks other than Tom Brady," what if there were a what, what, some kind of crazy idea about maybe there's a quarterback other than Tom Brady? You can't be sure that Tom Brady is um, the only quarterback. That's not the point, right? Um, 
the quarterback is just the role that the thing is playing in the system. Yeah, it just happens to be Tom Brady that is playing that role. Is that getting your point? Yeah, is that playing it right? Okay. Yep. Personifying it. Like, or, or like not personifying Because like we only, we only know that like, it's obviously a dog that looks hurt and acts hurt. And yeah. Like hits his foot. That's right. But like, it can't be certain it's like actually feeling pain. Is that right? Can't I mean, be certain it's feeling pain. I don't, I don't understand that. Like, only so your friend is sewing the legs off a dog and you sit by saying, well, we can't be sure. Um, <laughs> Really, I, I, you know, the thing is, you say that kind of thing when you're in abstract discussion, where you can't really be sure. It's, you can't. I mean, of course, you don't know whether it's in pain, but you don't really believe that for a moment in real life. If someone was actually torturing a dog, I promise you, you'd be furious. And if you didn't do something about it, people would say to you, "But you could see it. You could see it was in pain." It's the same as the lobster with the spoiler. Yeah, eye. lobsters are a difficult case. Lobsters. I mean, that's why I gave them. They're a genuinely but difficult like, case. Yeah, I, I know it's very hard to uh, to get your th your finger in that theoretically, but I just promise you, in real life, when you're not doing philosophy, you don't feel a moment's doubt about the distinction between these cases. I mean, nobody in their senses thinks that torturing animals for the fun of it is just okay because really they might not be feeling pain. You see what I mean? Um, Well, pain's unpleasant, yeah. How do you, well, the, what I was suggesting was you identify pain by this functional role. I don't think I have it up there but, uh, uh, t in, in this set of slides, but um, you identify pain as being typically caused by physical injury, um, giving rise to um, avoidance behavior, um, expressions of distress and so on. Yeah, that's how you identify pain. Yeah, I think that's actually what you do in the lobster. You would look at the functional structure of the lobster and see if there's something there that plays the functional role of pain receptors in a human. Yeah. If you've got that complexity and structure, then that's all you can do by way of answering the question, does it feel pain? Well, there, there are two things here. One is whether super Spartans, do super Spartans have the same functional structure as human beings? Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. If they've got the same functional structure as human beings, and the question then is just, does a lobster have that functional structure that's in common between humans and super Spartans? That's right, you can mask it. You, these, uh, it's like I said, these, see these arrows in this kind of diagram? Uh, bless it. Um, these arrows in this kind of diagram, uh, it's always going to be pretty complex here. I, I haven't shown any arrow to behavior here. But, if you, but there should be ultimately arrows to behavior because people do express their sorrow. But how you express your sorrow is not going to depend just on whether you're feeling sorrow. It's going to depend on a whole bunch of stuff about um, what kind of person you think you're talking to, what kind of is it a friend or an enemy, what kind of context you're in. You, you see what I mean? What you do about your sorrow will depend on a whole bunch of internal factors, not just on the sorrow itself. And similarly with pain, how you express your pain behaviorally is just built into this kind of diagram it will depend on a whole bunch of internal factors, not just on whether you feel pain. Yeah, uh, yeah you, you, you had a question for a while. No. Uh, okay, right. No? Okay, okay. Um, okay, so there's a question where this kind of diagram comes from. This kind of, I, I mean, I just did a kind of back of the envelope here, the functional structure of sorrow here. So just as, I mean, when we're talking about behaviorism, we said, I said there are two traditional ways of thinking of behaviorism. One is behaviorism is, is a, a school of thought in psychology that took the view psychology is a science of behavior. Psychology should not be uh, dealing with internal constructs, whether it's the brain or mind or anything else. Psychology should just be looking for laws governing behavior um, that deal with uh, 
the, the kind of behavioral variables as outputs and va variables about the environment as inputs. Um, so behavior should be described and explained without many, making any reference to mental events or other internal processes. That was in, sci in psychology. And behaviorists like that would say, we're going to throw common sense psychology out of the window. Um, so it's up to science to decide how behavior is classified. The kind of analytical behaviorism that we were talking about with Ryle, the kind of analytical behaviorism that you get in the, the, that was more characteristic of mainstream philosophy was uh, to say, no, we keep the ordinary notions of the mind. We keep ordinary concepts of pain, suffering, love, joy, bliss, um, ecstasy. <laughs> Just have a few positive examples for a change. Um, um, I'm running out of positive examples. Um, <laughs> joy, ecstasy, bliss, thrills, um, free songs, um, all that stuff. Uh, the, uh, they have their meaning in virtue of loose connections between the mental statements and statements about behavior. To understand any of these statements is to understand these kind of baggy connections that they have to lots of possible descriptions of behavior. Uh, so this one is, ties the behaviorism more to common sense talk about the mind. Uh, scientific behaviorism said, let's throw out the way we ordinarily talk and start again scientifically. Yeah? Um, when you say mind statements, yeah. do you mean the same thing as like brain states? Uh, no, uh, what I mean by statements about the mind is stuff like pain, joy, suffering, ecstasy, bliss, and so on. Yeah? yeah. Oh, like feelings. Feelings, yeah. Okay. And so can you Thinking. Brain states, things like um, assemblies of cell firings in V4. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Meaning a particular physiological area there. So um, I said that uh, functionalism was really sciences, philosophy of mind. And I said that th this is the kind of thing that you standardly find in any, um, say, vision science textbook. You get a breakdown of the physiology of the brain. And then you get told some story about the function, functionally what each of these bits of the brain are doing. That's, what, that's how science approaches the study of the brain and the mind. That is the scientific study of the mind. Um, and looking at it that way, you might say, well, um, if we're going to uh, define, uh, give functional definitions of psychological states, you don't want to do it in the back of the envelope way I just did. Um, really, at the end of the day, science defines the right functional categories for us to be using in studying human beings. So that's one approach, um, a kind of scientific functionalism. Um, another approach is to say, no, we actually know what sorrow is already. I'm sorry to say, each of us in this room already knows what sorrow is. Um, you know it from having known it yourself or from having known people who felt it. Um, and when you say, well, how do I know what kind of functional structure sorrow has? Well, really, what's going on? When you learn about the mind, what goes on is not uh, when you're learning about other people's minds when you're you know, three or four years old. What goes on is not that you learn a whole bunch of definitions or that someone shows you a box and arrow diagram for sorrow. You know, now you know what sorrow is. What happens is you interact with other people. You learn how to show uh, sympathy or hostility or affection for other people. You learn, as we say, how to push other people's buttons. You learn how to get on with other people socially. That's what learning about the mind is. And in doing that, I mean, an analogy might be like learning about base, uh, basketball. Right? One way to learn about basketball is to read a book and um, do, do the theory. But the way you really learn about basketball usually is by playing with other people and learning how to react to them. And when you're learning that, you can, um, there is a box and arrow diagram to be drawn of what a good basketball player does. But uh, when you write it down, you might do it well or badly. I mean, a good basketball player might be just terrific 
and knowing the functional structure of another player, knowing when a player that they've played against often, they just know when they're going to be reckless, when they're going to be weak, when they're going to be strong. Um, but when you get them to write it down, when you get them to talk about this, what they say might not be very good, right? It's one thing being able to do it. It's another thing being able to write it down effectively. Yeah. That's right. I'm saying just as there were two kinds of behaviorism, one scientific, the other one working, beginning with our ordinary understanding of the words. So there are two kinds of functionalism, one scientific, the other um, beginning with our ordinary understanding of, this, of the terms, our ordinary understanding of the words. Yeah. So what I'm saying is uh, learning the meaning of sorrow is something that we, th that kind of thing is something we all do, learning what it means when someone's angry or grumpy or happy or whatever. Um, that's something you, you, it's like learning basketball in that you don't do it um, by learning explicit definitions. You learn it by learning how to play with other people. You, yeah. And what I'm doing in writing down that diagram, um, writing down this diagram, is trying to make explicit something that we all know tacitly, something that we all can do. And you can be better or worse at making those things explicit. But we all know really what it means when someone is feeling sorrow. I mean, if you encounter someone who's had something terrible behave, happen to them, you know how to behave. Some people are better at it than others, but everyone's got some idea of how you behave then. And that's a matter of understanding the functional structure of the other person. But making it, ex and then the, uh, you, you just have to make that explicit. So this is not really scientific functionalism. This is just taking our ordinary understanding of sorrow and making it ex articulate writing down a diagram of something that we all know perfectly well. A bit as if, like learning to tie your shoes, you can do the thing, but what you've mastered when you try and write it down, how to tie a shoelace, that, that's not easy, actually. Yeah? Yeah? Are you arguing that it's possible? Oh, I'm not at all arguing it's impossible. I'm just arguing that um, it's, it's not trivial. You can, you can make mistakes doing it. And the important thing in everyday life is the actual practical skill of using this knowledge. Yep. Okay. So when you get a diagram like, just to play that one more time, when you get a diagram like this, there are two views you could have of why you would have a diagram like that for sorrow. One is science told me. I did a whole bunch of studies of people, and this is the way sorrow works. That's what science is telling you. Another way is to say, this is something we all know from everyday life, that we all use many times a, um, a week in interacting with other people. We know that kind of stuff. Anyway, we don't need science to tell us this. You, know what, you don't need to do some scientific study to know what sorrow is. Um, that's just something we learn as part of ordinary social life. Anything that didn't have that functional structure wouldn't be sorrow. Okay, so these are two views of, of the sources of these kind of functional descriptions of sorrow. Okay, here ends the first lesson. Plain as day? Yep. It looks, it certainly looks at behavior. It looks at behavior as output. Yeah. So in this kind of diagram, just to go back, yeah, ultimately you'd be looking at arrows too, um, crying, um, looking for friends, you know, uh, 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 clutching your head. I don't know. You'd have arrows going to that stuff. Yeah. The the only thing is, as I said, they'd be highly um, uh, indirect in the sense that it, there's not an arrow straight from the sorrow. That was really behaviorism's mistake, um, to say you can do an arrow straight from this state to behavior. Yeah. And that's not the way it goes at all. How you behave is a product of a many, many different psychological factors. It's never just one psychological factor at work. There's always a ton of stuff going on uh, underlying someone's behavior. Yeah. 
Um, so behavior certainly comes in in functionalism as the output, uh, as the ultimate output. But it's just that, how should I say, functionalism loves to dwell on the pathway to behavior. It says that's really the important thing, not really so much the behavior itself. Yeah. I mean, the same is true in science that, um, uh, I mean, this is just talking about the sensory input, but I could equally well have put up a diagram about motor output, yeah, and, and the functional analysis of how you get motor output, limb movements from the brain. Yeah. Okay, so is that clear why functionalism is almost irresistible? I mean, it's, it's a very powerful idea. Yeah? If I'm explaining this correctly, I hope you feel the pressure here to be functionalist because, as I say, it's, it, it is the current, uh, there is no other game in town, really, so far as um, the study of the mind and brain go. Functionalism is it. Yeah? The, the only trouble is it can't possibly be right. Or, or at any rate, this is what Bloch's arguing. Um, Let's look at Bloch's example of blockhead. Um, remember that the way it goes with variable realizability is that it's natural to think that being in pain, well, that has causes and effects, but it's not defined in terms of its causes and effects. And then variable realizability says, no, if it's got the right input-output structure, that's pain. That is the feeling of pain. There's no more to the feeling of pain than having that input-output structure. Now, here is Bloch's objection to functionalism. He says, well, suppose we were to convert the government of China to functionalism. This is another of these what-if statements. But the important point is that what Bloch's describing here is clearly possible. This thing evidently makes sense. We convert the government of China to functionalism and we convince its officials. <laughs> he doesn't really explain how you, <laughs> how you would do this. Or, but anyway, it would enormously, of how they would care, it would enormously enhance their international prestige um, to realize a human mind for an hour. Um, I mean, the really fantastic thing here is the picture of the politics of China. But anyway. Um, you can, you can certainly imagine that, right? Suppose you were a <coughs> dictator who had great power in a country and you could do this, right? Then um, all you do is you give each of the billion people in China a specially designed two-way radio that connects them in the appropriate way to other persons and to an artificial body. So basically, what you're doing is you're getting each person in China to simulate a neuron Something like that, yeah? You're getting each person in China to have a particular functional role. So you might say the task of one person is, if the current state is S4 and the input is Y, then the person changes the current state to S5 and outputs L. Now, when I say S5 and all that, th does that sound terribly technical? It is not terribly technical. This is um, what, what I was talking about with machine tables last time when you, remember we were talking about how to describe functional organization. And I said, when you're describing the functional role of a state S4, what you do is, this is in general how you describe functional role. You say what the inputs are, and for each input, you say what output you get for that input and what state you get next. Right? Remember that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, we remember that. Yes, yes okay, good. Right. Um, then that's all there is to functional organization, having those right inputs and outputs. Well, what Bloch's saying here is, if that's all there is to functional organization, then one person could be S4. Right? You get your telephone, you telephone, let's have L, <coughs> and you change the state. Yep. Uh, wait a minute. Do you know what I mean? Like the change keeps going to input 
Oh, that's right, that's right, that's right. There, there will be other states along here, that's right. Um, so th th this is just looking at zooming in on one particular bit of functional role, but your brain's very complicated. Your mind is very complicated. There are lots of these structures all over the place, yep. So then does functionalism say that there couldn't be sensory inputs X, Y, and Z all needing the same side? Is no, it doesn't say that. That could perfectly well happen. Different sensory inputs having the same outcome. Yep, no, no problem at all. Um, but that's all there is to functional organization. So whatever your functional organization is, this, um, uh, the way that the people are being structured here with uh, specially designed two-way radios connected to other people and to an artificial body, that could all be made to happen in a way that is absolutely functionally equivalent to you. So take the way that you're functionally structured right now. If you have enough people and they are willing to cooperate, then they could duplicate your functional structure, right? I mean, none of us is, is so complex that we have a functional structure that couldn't be duplicated in that way. So what you've got here is you've got a robot, you've got an artificial body that is being driven about by this complex structure of a billion people in just the same way that your body is being driven about, okay? So if your body reaches for water, that body will reach for water. If your body talks to someone else, that body will talk to someone else, yeah? It's being, dr in fact, you could imagine um, all the people here being miniaturized and put inside the head of the artificial body. And then you would have something that could look exactly like you, move and talk and act exactly like you. Someone um, talking to the two of you would not be able to tell which one was which, which one was the one with a regular biological brain, and which one had lots and lots of people in it driving it about. Yeah, it would be functionally exactly the same. Anything you, any test you did would be passed by both of them equally well. Because any test you could have would be just a matter of giving more inputs to the structure. And they both behave in the same way, functionally. So you get the same outputs. So you're not going to have any test that can differentiate between you and this um, complex structure. But Block's point is, suppose you've got the thing being driven about by a billion people. Does that, if you call it a homuncular headed system, does that have any mental states at all? There are the mental states of the individual people, yeah, but the question, but what, that, that, that's right, that's important. But what Block here means to be asking is, does the whole system have any mental states at all? Like with the Apple Corporation, you get, well, <laughs> um, you get, you get a complex structure, right? Um, each of the individuals there has mental states. Does the whole thing have mental states? Yeah. Hard to believe. Yep. Yeah. Cut, cut If it's a general opinion? Yeah, it's like similar to like company culture, right? If you're talking about a company like Apple or something like that, it's like the company has a certain way. People feel a certain way about certain things. There's general consensus. OK, that's very good. There, there could be general consensus among the people of China, say that, um, um, let's say that uh, there is general consensus among the people of China that uh, 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 Mars is going to be inhabitable eventually, right? But suppose we program the robot, suppose we program them all to, um, to uh, uh, pull the levers in such a way that the robot says, Mars will never be inhabitable. They're just running the program, right? They're just doing what they're told. They're just... Um, uh, uh, being given their instructions and following their instructions. So what the consensus is among these people is one thing, and what the whole system is doing is another. Yeah? I mean, you actually get the same point with corporations, that um, is one thing for everyone in a, in a corporation to be perfectly good-hearted 
and um, the consensus among the corporation, among all the individuals in the corporation, might be never treat people badly. The corporation as a whole can still be evil. Yeah, I mean that's that's not just an imaginary that's not just an imaginary example that can really happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the question here is. Can you make sense of any mental states being had by the whole robot? I mean, the whole um, structure of a billion people, not just what the individual thinks, not what the consensus is among the individuals. Does it make any sense to suppose that the whole thing has some kind of mind? Yep. The cricket team, yes, right. He says that the keenness with which they play. The keenness with which they play, yes, right. Like their team spirit. Their team so spirit. Like if, if you say, like, if you had a smaller team, you know, like Billy and Eric, they all, like, yeah. weren't able to, like, pass the clubs as, like, a certain output from playing out of different things, but with certain keenness. Yeah. That keenness be said to be, like, the mental state of the You You could put it like that. that, that I mean, that's very good. But the thing is, is one thing to take a kind of aggregate of the mental states of all the people there. And that's really what you're talking about when you talk about keenness. But um, what, you, what we're talking about here is not an aggregate of what all the individuals feel, but whether the whole system has a life of its own. Yeah, because I mean, with you, it's not as if your feelings are a kind of aggregate of everything that your individual neurons are feeling. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's not it at all, right? You, the whole thing, that's, what, that's where the mind comes onto the tracks when you're dealing with the whole human being, yeah? But this whole thing doesn't seem to have any feelings at all of its own. Um, l let me just get home here and then the, 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 I'll take this question. L let me just get home here and then I'll take this question. Um, the the remark Block makes... Um, is especially, you might wonder, whether this whole structure has what philosophers have variously called qualitative states, raw fields, or immediate phenomenological properties. <coughs> and by that he means, I, I, I don't know of any way of explaining this notion that he's after here, but, but by giving an example. Um, when, I was, um, when I was at school, there was something that um, we then called Chinese burns. I, I believe that here they're called Indian burns. Do, do, do you know what I mean? That's it. Okay. So would you care, stand up? <laughs> would, you, would you care to demonstrate? You don't, don't demonstrate in me, but just. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Right. You, you, you know this. Um, you, you can try this at home. Um, try the <laughs> try this with a friend. Right. Now, um, if you're trying to explain what that feels like, I mean, can you put your hand up if you've had this done to you? Okay, <laughs> very good. <laughs> right. It's funny how so, you know some things are just fads and fashions, but some things really stand fast. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so you know what that feels like, that right? So that feeling that you get when someone is really giving you a good one like that, right? Um, that's what block means by a qualitative state or a raw feel or an immediate phenomenological property, right? It's something that just kind of lights up your sensations. Um, and the question is, does Bloch's robot have anything like that? If you do that to Bloch's robot, and all the, if you take the arm, the arm of the robot, and all the guys inside are phoning each other, and pushing the buttons, and connecting with each other, and making the limbs move of the artificial robot, does that whole thing have anything like the feeling that you get when someone does that to you? What do you think? Put your hand up if you think the answer is yes. How would you know? I, wait a second. <laughs> if you think the answer is no, if you think the answer is no, that the robot doesn't have any of that stuff, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, <laughs> right. okay. if you have no idea what I'm talking about, your duty is to ask a question. <laughs> you, you, you should say where you got off the bus. But yeah, yeah. The only things we know for certain are our own feelings. I understand that when you're doing philosophy, it's really natural to take that line, we only know our own feelings. But I just think that in real life, that's just not how any of us think. Yeah? Um, I mean, look, to take a Haraway example, suppose you, your neighbors are, um, 
abusing a child. And the, the social work services say to you, but you knew this was going on. Why didn't you tell someone? And you say, well, I did philosophy three. You know, I realized that <laughs> you, know, you never know for certain whether I'd ever accept yourself as feeling anything. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you don't really believe that. You see what I mean? You, nobody thinks that for a second. If um, someone sitting next to you shows a lot of distress, you would have to be sociopathic to just stare at them and say, strange, you know? <laughs> you see what I mean? It's, it's very natural and abstract thinking to take that view. But I just think we don't really believe that for an instant. None of us, yeah? Uh, OK. <laughs> um, yeah, yes, one, two. That's a good question. I mean, what do you think? We've looked at four theories of what feelings are. And none of them seem to be valid. Okay, so uh, what's your point? I'll, I'll ask you, <laughs> what are feelings? What I mean, are feelings? Not, not, not feeling does that's, that's, that's why this is a university course, <laughs> right? I mean, um, we are looking at, uh, th th this is why consciousness, uh, there isn't a single soundbite answer to that. And I would not be doing a class on this if there were a single quick soundbite answer to it. Yeah. Um, this is why consciousness is one of the top 10 outstanding scientific problems. There is no soundbite answer to the question, what is a feeling? It is really for you guys to think, look, here are, I'm really telling you the state of the art in theorizing about these things. Um, you have, oh, and this is philosophy, it's not like there is some hidden scientific knowledge here. You have all the pieces, and it's not like science. It, I mean, what science has to tell you is basically more about functional role. So it's not as if there is some hidden scientific thing here. You have all the pieces. You have all the pieces that I have, actually. Um, and your task is figure that out. Yeah, there isn't some piece that... I'm keeping from you. Yeah, uh, there was a question here. Um, in Kevin's article, Defining Autism, he talks about how it has to be one body thing. Like, you said the, uh, the form of being isn't a function. Very good. And so, so, like, this entire argument um, isn't really, I mean, the whole, you know, Kevin said you can't have it be a bunch of little tiny things. It has to be one entire self. Uh-huh. Now, I agree. Putnam did say that, and I think that's very important. It's, it's one sign of Putnam's brilliance that it was, it was there, you know, in a, a brief aside yeah, in that original article. Um, but the puzzling thing about that remark of Putnam's is, why should you put that restriction on it? Yeah? Why should you put that restriction? I mean, it's as if you said, um, functional structure is what makes something pain. Functional structure is what makes something love. But... Um, of course, the functional structure mustn't be made of more organisms. Then why not? Because it's as if you said the functional structure mustn't be made of copper or it mustn't be made of carbon. Well, why not? If functional structure is the important thing, then it shouldn't matter what the thing is made of. Yeah? So it really seems just arbitrary to put that restriction on that Putnam did. That, that, that is, I, I agree, and that, uh, and right, but why not, right? If uh, that, that, that see, in effect, what you're saying is, put, do, do people know the passage that you're referring to? That, that uh, in that original article that we looked at uh, last week, um, Putnam did say he says it in a in a brief aside that uh, you can't make this functional structure of smaller organisms. Something made of bees shouldn't count as having a group mind. And you're saying that's right. If you make it a bees, it can't have a group mind. But the puzzling thing is why not? Because the functionalism seems to explain how that could happen. Y you see what I mean? It's as if you were, I mean, if you had an argument that um, if you thought creatures made of metal can't feel pain, 
And then you said, but look, I'm a functionalist about pain. Um, uh, so of course, something made of metal could have the same functional structure as you or me. Therefore, something made of metal could feel pain. And then you say, well, no, but you, what I meant by functionalism was, if it's got the same functional structure of you or, as you or me, and it's not made of metal. <laughs> well, why is that? You, you see what I mean? Is, is that just because you're being metalist, uh, as it were, or anti-metal? Uh, you, you see what I mean? Exactly. If you had a sol solution to the problem in the first place, then how could uh, how could that help? How do you have the right to make that move? Okay. Yep. Whoa. Multiple minds, like, don't have that special connection. To ectoplasm. Yeah, That's right. You could say that. That's right. You could say. Well, you could say, look, humans, are, what's special about us is we've got the ectoplasm. The, 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 the group mind there doesn't have the ectoplasm, right? Um, uh, that's fine. The, th the trouble is, I mean, what I mean is that's fine. <laughs> what I mean is um, you can say that. But in saying that, what you've done is you've thrown the functionalism out of the window. The whole point was to get away from the ectoplasm or to get away from the idea that it's just the particular brain state that matters. Yeah? And in fact, this problem for functionalism is very deep in the way functionalism, functionalism is set up. <laughs> We're saying that all there is to being in pain is having this functional structure. And then the trouble is that... Um, um, the robot can instantiate that structure, right, with all these people pushing the levers and talking on the phone. Uh, the robot can have that structure. So you have to say the robot feels pain. The robot can feel a Chinese burn or whatever it is. Um, um, and the way that happens is we're trying to be respectful of variable realizability. We're trying to say it doesn't matter what particular brain state you've got, so long as you've got that functional structure. That is how you can recognize that the octopuses have pain, because they've got that abstract functional structure. That's how you can recognize that the aliens could feel pain, because they could have that functional structure. But the trouble is that the theory went so abstract in order to let in um, aliens and octopuses and so on as having mental states, not just us, but it's let in blockhead too. Yep, yep. Well, couldn't you argue that something has to actually be alive or have some sort of physical sensory uh, perceptions to be able to feel be sensations alive. like pain? Yeah, well, well yes, yes, like, yes. I have a friend who she doesn't have any nerve endings like in yeah. her arm or something. Uh -huh. Yes, right, so right. if her whole arm applied to her whole body, then hypothetically she wouldn't be able to feel pain. Yes. Because she has no physical sensory ability. Uh, that's right, that's right. But, well, there's a lot of room for mo maneuver in how you describe the inputs. Yeah, uh, If you describe the input as um, uh, if she can't have any bodily injury at all, then I guess there's a sense in which she's not capable of pain. Yeah, so would yeah. Would that apply to the whole blockhead idea? Uh, well, the, the, if you cut the robot, it yells. It says, stop that. Yeah, if you divide the flesh of the robot, I mean, it doesn't have flesh. If you, if you divide the steel of the robot, it cries out. But it's only it says, for God's sake. It says, how can you do that? <laughs> yeah. You, you see what I mean? That's right. Today. That is right. So, <laughs> so what? Is that not actually feeling pain then? You're just, you're just uh, giving the programmed response to pain? Well, is it, uh, why don't you just program by genetics and your environment? Yeah? I mean, how, how, how come if you get programmed by genetics and your environment, you can feel sensation, but if you get the identical program being input by a human, that doesn't count? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And you can consider almost like being alive under like the terms of like variable realizability. 
you could consider it being alive under variable realization. Sure. Where like, that you could be alive in like very different like forms, like you can have like a different kind of like interpret that in space. Yep. Um, yeah, that, that, that's completely fair. Um, the only trouble is that whatever definition you give, it's going to look like blockhead is alive too. You, you see what I mean? Because um, Certainly, if you saw a blockhead moving, and that you'd say that thing's alive. It's generating its own movements and so on. You, you see what I mean? Yeah. If you're under that, I would be defining the blockhead as being alive. Right. And I guess uh, like a lot of people would like argue about whether or not it's like alive when you have like a perception of like what it means to be alive. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Last one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, would it being able to generate an answer that, I mean, like, because I would think that you wouldn't program the robot to, like, have a favorite color or have an opinion. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, well, look, there are yeah, look, the, uh, it's got the same functional structure as you. It's functionally equivalent to you. If given the question, what's your favorite color, you say red, that's what Blockhead says. Yeah. Or if your uh, favorite out, uh, output for that question is, that's a stupid question. Oh, what do you mean favorite color? Right, that's what Blockhead will say. You, you, you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Blockhead will do whatever you do. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, I oh, blast it. <laughs> okay, so there's a re it's really deep the way, uh, the way uh, quick one, yeah. I was gonna say, if we don't fully understand the functional organization of our cells, yeah. Well, what we know is that um, there's no more, according to functionalism, there's no more to our mental states than the functional structure. So whatever that functional structure turns out to be, it will be possible for Blockhead to implement it. And we're not, you know, we're not that complex. There are only finitely many neurons in the brain. I mean, in principle, you can understand the whole thing functionally. Sorry? That's right. Yeah, yeah, it's finite. I mean, there are already animals where the brain's been fully mapped. Um, it's only a matter of time before the human brain is fully mapped. Yeah, uh, yeah, but I mean, we haven't done that. No, we haven't done that yet, but when we do, it will be, I mean, that's what it is, it's a functional diagram, that's what you're doing. Yeah. So of course it will be possible to get, to have a blockhead uh, given enough people that will do the same thing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, actually this is the, passage from Putnam that uh, one of the questioners just quoted. No organism capable of feeling pain possesses a decomposition into parts and separately possess functional or organizations characteristic of mental states. To rule out such organisms as they can tend to touch are swarms of bees, a single pain feeler. Yeah. So Putnam anticipated block subjection, but what I was saying earlier was it's hard to see why uh, you, Putnam has the right to make that separation as if he just said, but actually, my f the, the best response to this I know was actually given by someone in this class a couple of years ago. Uh, I, I haven't seen this response. In, it may be in the literature, but I haven't seen it. Um, this is by an undergraduate in this class. So I, I say this to go back to the uh, point I was making earlier. You have all the pieces here, actually. Um, you, 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 know, you, you, you have as much capacity to make a contribution to this as anyone else. Uh, and this seems to be a real contribution. Um, Pikash said, um, each of the people constituting Bloch's robot is a free agent, right? So when you think through what's going on with Bloch's robot, does it really have the same functional structure as a human being? No, because your neurons can't revolt. Your neurons can't say, what the hell are we doing this for? Are we being paid or what? Um, the neurons can't get together and say, this is dumb. Well, you, you, you see what I mean? But um, it's one of the great simplifications. You just take it on board with Bloch's example. Look, each of these people are just going to do exactly what they're told. But each of these people is a free agent. They can do whatever they like. And that's part of really what you know about this. So the pe these people being on their phones and so on and moving the thing, that's a matter of their voluntary agreement, which um, could be withdrawn at any moment, they really might all get together and say, 
we are out of here. We think this is stupid and demeaning, and we're not having anything to do with it, right? So people could do that. Your neurons couldn't do that. Therefore, this structure, the blockhead structure, has a different functional organization to a human being. A blockhead structure could not have the same functional um, uh, structure as a human being. If you look at the neurons firing in the human brain, those neurons are not individual agents. It's not as if they can withdraw. So blockhead's functional structure is going to actually be quite different to that of the human brain. And it's because of that difference in functional structure that we resist so strongly the idea that blockhead has a mental life. That seems to me an extremely powerful response in on part of the functionalist to, uh, to Bloch's objection. As I say, that was an undergraduate in this class, and it seems to me as good as anything I've read in the, in, in the literature. Um, uh, so it may, maybe we can hang on to the idea that pain is just a matter of having a particular functional structure. One, two. Yeah. If you build around computers? Yeah. yeah. Well, computers, computers have remote features. Yeah. It, it depends what you mean. You, I mean, you, 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 the whole idea of artificial intelligence is that you could make something intelligent and sentient, something conscious, that was a machine. Yeah. And um, uh, Bloch's thing seemed more powerful than that. Yeah. Just because it seems so crazy to suppose that this thing can feel anything. But when people talk about intelligent robots or um, Blade Runner kind of scenarios where you have things that are conscious and feel, even though they are artificially generated, yeah, it doesn't seem so. Most people feel a bit torn about that. Yeah? On the one hand, there are people who say, nothing made of steel could have feelings the way I do. On the other hand, there are people who say, but that's just um, sentimental speciesism to think like that. Yep. I have the same question. Oh, you have the same question. OK, right. Um, OK, um, we've got just a few minutes left. I w uh, w sh shall we, uh, we, we could go on, but shall we try to uh, do this thing about hearing what theses people would think of arguing for? Is that a good idea? I haven't tried doing this before, so let's see what happens. Um, OK, I'm, I'm going to give you another 10 seconds just to think about it, and then I'll call on people at random. OK? So remember your essay, and you don't get to run for the door, by the way. So, okay, so uh, your deadline a couple of weeks, the first thing you've got to do is think of the main thesis for which you're going to argue in your essay, okay? Um, so I'll give you 10 seconds starting now to think of something. Okay, in the blue t-shirt. You? <laughs> you? Yeah? What's your thought? Yeah, about writing about what? Dualism. Yeah, okay. For, for or against? Against dualism. So your main thesis is going to be something like dualism is, I think dualism is wrong. Yes, 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 that's right, that conceivability yeah. argument. Great, OK, that's terrific. OK, I, I, I'm just curious. I just want to hear a, a, a sampling, but that's great. That's exactly the kind of thing. Uh, yeah, you. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Behaviorism, uh huh. Are you for it? Yeah. Very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, great. Uh, um, um, you? Oh, okay, Me the animals with mental states like ours, but without brains like ours. Yeah. I would argue for that because in another class I would think about um, in the salamander brains. Salamander brains, uh huh, very good. Yeah. More into ours, but they may or may not have the same mental motion as ours. Okay. So I would think about 
That's great. And it's great to work with a, de with a particular example there, too. Excellent. Um, if, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at whoever's. Uh, I, I can't tell how to catch. In the, in the red shop? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you. Yeah. Um, Uh huh. So you <laughs> that's a good philosophical approach. Yeah. <laughs> There's a few important distinctions I want to draw, and a few hairs I want to split. Yeah. <laughs> right. About behaviorism. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you mean split hairs? Uh, about different types of behaviorism or something like that? Um, yeah. And, and like how, like in what instances it is working, and whether you can like change those. Right. Okay. That's great. Okay. Um, the lady at the back is. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, just two seats from the... B <laughs> Hello? <laughs> no, next to you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, one of whose arguments? Putnam's. One of Putnam's arguments about hate behaviorism. So, uh, looking at whether the super Spartans argument is any good, uh, something like that. So your main thesis is going to be something like, I think the super Spartans argument is terrific, or I think it's no good, or... Yeah, yeah. okay, okay. And you, uh, in, the, in the blue t-shirt? Uh, let's have both of you. <laughs> right. um, ar 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 around the last person. The two of you on either side of the last person. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and, and you? Functionalism, uh huh. Oh, in favor of arguing in favor of functionalism. Okay, so the main thesis is going to be something like I think functionalism is a good thing. Yeah. Okay. One, two, three. Yeah. Okay. Isn't isn't that what functionalism is? Okay. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. Okay. Um, one, two. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. The green T-shirt. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, um, well, I might be more of a question. If you agree with uh, some what somebody put forth, for example, the Tea Party, aren't aren't you limited in how much you can take from the Tea Party system? Well, yeah. I think it's fine to just agree with someone. Um, it, whether you're limited in how you can write is really. I mean. There's always a lot to be said in just explaining what someone's arguments are. And usually, my own experience is, um, and I think this is probably true for most people, that if you try and write down what someone's argument for their position is, whether it's Bloch or Putnam or Descartes, um, you usually find there's a point at which the argument doesn't really seem to work. You see what I mean? You can't really explain convincingly what they're up to. And that generates more writing of its own if you see what I mean, because it's then obvious to you that there's a big objection here. And then you've got to think, what am I going to say to that objection? So yeah. Be uh, the, then you'd have to rewrite the paper. Well, yeah. yeah. That's why I'm suggesting. OK. And the, the last one. Yeah. Yeah. You do have to directly answer one of the prompts. Yeah. Um, you, you are not encouraged to go off-road in this. Answer one of the prompts. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.